Amigos de Usala Media, estamos aquí de nuevo con su programa Campas. Les habla Fernando Méndez, Dani Ramos dirige este programa, mi invitada especial el día de hoy, Jennifer Rodríguez, from the Hispanic, Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. That's a mouthful. No, Bienvenida, it is, welcome. It is, it is. So welcome. Thank you so much. I know, you know, I think when the organization was officially established, uh, names were much longer than these days, right? Uh, so, yeah. anyway, we're working on it. Yeah. I was there at the, at the inception, as I, I love to point out. <laughs> but maybe I shouldn't, because that dates me also. We will not talk about the early days. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Lamboy, Angel Ortiz, Angel Medina. Uh, wow. It's been over 30 years. Yeah, oh, a long we time. just dated you. And the, the lawyer, uh, Andrew Gay, was the one who did all the statutes and all that. So anyway, but and here we are. And now here we look are. how far you have brought this organization. So I was looking at your bio, See? and it says prior to joining uh, the Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce, she was appointed by Mel Nutter as the executive director of the mayor's office of Immigrant and Multicultural Affairs. Was that the first office, the first time they opened that office? Yes, it's the first time inaugural office, if you right. will. Yeah. So in this capacity, according to the, the note here, you made Philadelphia a very attractive place to visit. We made Philadelphia a very welcoming place for immigrants. Mm. Uh, and since then, the city has proven itself to be uh, one of the top destinations for immigrants in the country. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, the reason why population had been increasing in the 2000s up to today uh, was mostly because immigrants felt that the city welcomed them, that had the social structure, the legal structure, the policies, that were favorable to them. Mm -hmm. So, because I usually work backwards instead yes. of what normally it should be, a little mm -hmm. biographical note from, you know, where are you from originally and all, all this? Sure. Um, born and raised in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And I came to the United States to do, to go to school back in the 90s and made my way from Boston to Washington, D.C., ultimately here to Philadelphia to do my master's degree. And I thought I would go back to Washington, D.C., but really the city is um, has a way of, for those that really value architecture, history, urban life, diversity, right. and just really walkability and livability. I think the city of Philadelphia, bar none, is, is um, on the top of the list. So your entry point was Washington or Boston? Uh, Boston to the U.S., mm -hmm. yeah. yes. And so I, I love the architecture in Boston, it's like Philly too, so. Yes, yeah. very similar, right? Yeah. So I, I really, once, you know, after you're in Boston for a few years, uh, you know, and you come here, you feel very familiar. It's a, it's a very mm -hmm. familiar environment for me, yeah. I've always found Philly to be a very livable city. Uh, it used to be even more so, but uh, you know, life is getting very expensive, with daily life everywhere, not only here. But I think Philly is still a very attractive place with so many things about culture and entertainment and, and all that. And life seems to be like a big city, but in a small space. Yes, I, I think it has all the, attribute, all the best attributes of large cities with many of the attributes of smaller places, right? Mm -hmm. So the reality, we, we joke around that Philadelphia is a city of a million and a half individuals, but the, this idea of the six degrees of separation is very much, you know, you, they're invariably, you will go somewhere and say, where are you from or who do you know? And you'll find somebody else that, that is in your network. It's a very, right. very tightly knit community for, for most. and. It just affords a certain affordability. What, look, while the cost of living in the city has, you know, really escalated over mm -hmm. the last 15 years or so, I will say that I just came back from Washington D.C. and that if if Philadelphia is expensive, D.C. is out of control expensive. Right. So even 
relative to other cities in the East Coast, I think it provides the top value, in my opinion. Yeah, Washington, D.C. is one of those places where people who actually work in Washington have to find places to live in Virginia or Maryland, you know, outside of, yeah. of D.C. Washington used to have a very, very concentrated population of African Americans, and I think that's but for disappeared. They're, they're, in, not in a they're just not there anymore, yes. Yeah, what, is, what has happened here, true, with, with parts of the city, you yeah. know, West Philadelphia, which you know, the University of Pennsylvania keeps growing west. Yep. Drexel keeps growing. So it has taken up a lot of the old neighborhoods in yep. that part of the city. So, yeah, that progression and, if, well, and cities are living it's places, normal, you know, right? right? They do yeah. go through, right. they, they're, they're constantly evolving and you'll see demographic, demographic changes, uh, you know, wholesale neighborhoods over the, the decades and generations have changed and that's no different. Experiencing it and being, being in the middle of it, I'm sure, can be disconcerting for, for a lot of families and right. individuals. Uh, but that's just really the nature of, it, <laughs> pretty much the nature of cities and, and, and you know. So I don't know uh, yeah, how well, do we, we manage it. Is, we're in the midst of that, this mm -hmm. American yeah. street. Yeah. Uh, as, as you can see, I mean, physically has changed. Significantly from and, an industrial center to uh, now what is um, really mixed use, right. you know, with, with residential development really taking hold here. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So it brings up a sort of a sore point with, with uh, politicians, with uh, city uh, managing uh, director, whether a gentrification. You know, it's one of those things. How do you, how do you improve life in the city without doing that? For, for without displacing. Well, I think um, I would say that the oftentimes we look at neighborhoods and we look at areas of a city as um, uh, you know we talk about number of houses and you know so sort of like the metric that we use is housing units. Um, and we invest in housing. I really am one that thinks that we should really be thinking as the measuring unit being people and families and households and investing in families and households and not necessarily investing in the physical environment. Because what's happening mm -hmm. is when, you know, redevelopment programs and regeneration programs and strategies are in place, a lot of it focuses on let's build new housing and let's transform this physical environment to make it better for the people that live here, right? But we don't simultaneously invest in those families at the same level to ensure that they can themselves be ready to afford that community once that community becomes more desirable, right? So, but so there's when and there are no we have not really been very proactive and i'm the same philadelphia only i think this is a an issue that happens around the country very proactive in really securing affordability ahead of time so by the time the city governments intervene and want mm -hmm. to secure and preserve housing it's too late right so you know when the when the neighborhood has already appreciated it's not the time for the city to say let's build affordable housing you really want to ensure that it is there right. so by the time the private sector comes that housing is already preserved right so you don't have to compete so that's in look it's difficult the cities you know they're not necessarily don't have the the resources that it's required to do that. A lot of the housing that, you know, in Philadelphia being a union town, um, the cost of producing housing is so high, the subsidy levels are so high that you cannot pick, you cannot really meet the demand the way the, that the system works today. Right, which brings up also two topics. One of them, for, as far as I'm concerned, uh, in terms of education, no, we don't need more BAs, no, no, people, no English majors and all that. We need uh, engineers, architects, builders, 
roofers, electricians. And, and I think our educational system has sort of not provided that. Like the Germans have it, the Japanese have it. They mm -hmm. have, no, they have, at, at some point, yeah, yeah, apprenticeship-based right. education program. Brexit mean, had that, but yeah. yeah, and it still does. I think we need everything. I I think a, a, a world without humanities, I'm not sure that's a world worth I, I, living I was in, to right? Make a point, so um, don't but, pickle me for that. <laughs> but you, we certainly uh, there's a lot of pressure, and I think it's a good to move towards a skill-based economy and a, not a degree-based economy, right? So. Can we, and how do we ensure that people have the skills that they need and the certi you know, certifications that they need in order to skillfully perform a job and that the only deciding factor in hiring an individual is not whether you got an associate's degree, a bachelor's right. degree, or, or a master's degree. Not, and, but that there's room for that. But I think we have overly emphasized um, the attainment of educational degrees, right? and not sufficiently focused on skill-based. Mm. And the reality is, I don't know, in many industries, you know, you're probably further ahead with a skill-based, uh, you know, job than right. a the degree job. Um, because you can so, start at any age. You don't have to well, wait for a well, degree and, for and, years and, or six and, years. And look, I think when I say that, you know, it. The reality is most people have to obtain loans, student loans, in order to obtain that degree. So in the end, when you do the math, you, you have your salary, you deduct the, the loan by the end, you know, what is left versus somebody that went through an apprenticeship program or certificate mm -hmm. program where the financial investment is probably much more limited, if any, and then you may, you know, you earn whatever you earn and you don't have the loans to deal with. Right. And so you might end up, you know, in a better situation. Now, many of these skilled jobs, you know, the, everything has a pro and a con. Many of these jobs, particularly if they're trade or manual, um, they do require a bot, a physical body mm -hmm. in shape, right? Like it, it, it can right. be taxing to sure. the, to your body as you become older in a way that, you know, other jobs might not be. So there's, you know, what is it that you do towards your, the end of your career when you are looking for retirement? If, if you don't have that degree, what happens, right? The advantage of having the degree is that perhaps your working life can be extended mm -hmm. beyond what, True. what other, that. Other trades, or other professions, or, or or occupations might. So you know, it's a it can be a pretty complicated. But what I all of that to say, that I think it's really good that we have employers. We just heard the new governor that was eliminating was the requirement of bachelor's yeah. degrees in order to um, to get a job. I mean, when that may not, it's not necessary. It, it's, in most instances, in in my. It, I mean, in my opinion. Yeah, well, in many cases, recognizing uh, the value of experience yeah. over studies or whatever. Correct, you know, so. correct, I think. I think, you look, um, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, uh, you know, they certainly are important, have their place. I often think that, particularly for, for most jobs, that, you know, that the average individual working class person <clears throat> is might aspire to don't necessarily require it um, mm -hmm. so yeah yeah we, um, well we're here in, in, in this conversation is is taking place in a during a very so I think the historic couple of days for the first time a president is indicted and that that is big news uh, and I, I don't know if you you might not want to get into the political <laughs> thing, but but I, anyway, so cannot ignore the fact that we are going through a very historic period here. Look, we so. are. It looks like we are in a transition period. Period, right? You know, um, in many ways, uh, our economy is transitioning. Yeah. Our democracy is in a very 
um, I would say tenure situation, or is like mm -hmm. there are a lot of questions about American democracy or democracy really around the world. Um, and leadership, I think we, in my opinion, um, we probably have a leadership crisis in this country and in many countries at all levels. Yeah. Right. Anyway, so this will be a, a speaking of transitions, this will be a good time to take a short break here in. Uh, Usa la media. Estamos en una conversación con Jennifer Rodríguez from the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And now we're going to continue this conversation now that she brought it up about what is democracy? What is happening to our democracy? No se vayan, regresamos en un momento. Pagano's Market and Bar has been serving gourmet Italian foods in Center City for three generations. Call Matthew Pagano for all your catering needs, and during these difficult times, please mention Fernando Mendez and receive a nice discount along with free delivery. Pagano's also makes the finest gift boxes in the city for all your holiday needs. Visit paganosmarketingbar.com. Amigos de Usa Media, estamos aquí de nuevo en Compass, en una conversación con Jennifer Rodriguez, from the Greater Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Um, so, Jennifer, you opened the door to this sort uh -oh. of <laughs> democracy yeah. discussion in, in a very generic way. We, I do feel that the previous administration, the previous government, undermined all our institutions, and that would take a generation to rebuild confidence in the FBI, in our intelligence services, in the justice uh, system, uh, well, you name it. Well, um, I think this has been sort of something in the making for many, many years. I think when we do not, as a society, do not value uh, journalism, do not really ensure that that journalism is alive and well and mm -hmm. independent. Um, you know, increasingly journalism has been decimated over this country. I think having that as a as a check and balance to the entire government, not only the three branches of government, having checks and balances on each other, and we know how can that, and we know how that can be challenged. You know, you can. You know, if, if you have a strategy, as uh, you know, some parties have, of really <coughs> flooding the judicial uh, system with, uh, with their philosophies, right, um, you can really, you know, that, that check and balance between judicial and the other branches of government can be, you know, uh, you know, messed with, if you will, like right. <laughs> with a very, my vocabulary being very, very great here. Um, so I think in journalism is one of those elements that we really need to be paying attention to. And I think there's real concern in this country that that is, that our journalism is not what it should be to, right. to keep that democracy abreast, right? But then there's education as well. Mm -hmm. And we have seen how the, this nation educational standards have an attainment, and I'm not saying attainment, you know, did you get a bachelor's degree or not. I'm talking about just basic measures of literacy, of, um, you know, of, they're just not there. Yes. And, and we're seeing now state governments that are really uh, putting pressure on school districts and curriculum development, and mm -hmm. just, there are a lot of pressure points that are really, uh, that can impact uh, a democracy in, in, from what I understand and I've, my readings and a and yes. little bit of research that I've done. Well, as, as, as you smartly pointed out, uh, we don't have a sociology degree to discuss all these political <laughs> implications. <laughs> but we do have our opinions, don't we? No? <laughs> but as I always say, also it doesn't stop me from issuing my opinion. But um, yeah, I agree with you that education uh, in that sense Civics, people Correct. should know about government. People should know what, what what it means. What is democracy? Why why do I vote? Why do I have this freedom? Is it in danger? 
you and know, basic literacy, right? right. Media right. literacy, consumer as a cons how do you right. consume information? Right. I think if you know, there's some basic things that I learned in school about you know primary sources of information, secondary sources of information. Right. That is very basic. You know, you learn how government works or doesn't work, what your duties are as a citizen are or not, and then you need to learn the basics of science and and scientific theory and what a hypothesis is and how you how you test for things those are very basic building blocks that if we as a society do not have them we will not be able to tell fact from fiction how to criti be think critically um, what the role of government and our leaders are the ethics behind it you know and making decisions it just those very basic, basic building blocks, if we're not, not there, we are jeopardizing the entire system. Right. The, you, you, you fall prey to charlatans or yeah. you know, people who would exploit that. Yeah, you cannot, take the, nice. you cannot tell the difference. You don't even know how to question you know, right. your sources of information. And mm -hmm. things now, everything looks legitimate unless you know what questions to ask, unless you know what uh, verifiable sources of information are. So if you don't have those skills, if they're not taught to you, you will not be able to tell the difference, fact or fiction. And, and if you're not taught what truth and fact are, then that's the scientific method, right? You know, so the distinguishing a hypothesis from an opinion, you know, what's a fact, what is not, all of that is science. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and if we're not teaching that to our students, we're going to have, and we are seeing it, right? We're having, yes. uh, you know, a, a crisis of, in, our, in our country, I think. It's a crisis of confidence in this system because mm -hmm. it, it has failed in so many ways. You, you um, listen to you, you sound like a journalist. So what did you study? I have a bachelor's in business administration and a master's degree in city planning. So it's sort of that intersection of civic government and the private sector mm -hmm. that interests me so much. Yeah, but you sound like a journalist when you uh, address the whole thing about need to verify what you well, because I, I, I did go through classes and I learned the scientific method and I, you know, I had the basics, right? So, you, I mean, point, point being that if you have that foundation, then you can be a better consumer mm -hmm. of everything, in my right. opinion. In, yeah. So, Jennifer, here we are. Um, not, not, we already spoke about the, the fact that we are in a historic you're right. Eventually, when they write the, in the history books about this time, they will write. I, I will. I, They'll I write would about like you, Fernando. I don't. No, I don't think so. I'm, <laughs> I'm a very uh, tiny contribution to whatever is happening in the world. But um, we also went through COVID, uh, which devastated the world economy in, in this country. And it destroyed the restaurant industry in Philadelphia at a point in which we were at the top of the heap. Mm. Yeah. Philadelphia restaurants were well known and affected employment for a lot of people, immigrants especially, where, where the, the service interest industry is an entry point for them. And so you must have seen that. Yes, absolutely. Well, I will say that COVID <laughs> um, destroyed the economies of the most vulnerable mm -hmm. and those that are at the top of the the economic ladder probably did much better right. and and really became wealthier which is you know that gap in wealth in and this the gap country keeps is just continues to to grow and grow um, and at the bottom of that economic ladder oftentimes we find the immigrant community mm -hmm. um, who provide essential services and we really could not survive in this world without their labor and contributions. Uh, many of them, in fact, um, turned towards the food industry and restaurant industry for employment, 
because uh, the barriers to entry are very low, whether you are in the labor side mm -hmm. or in the entrepreneurship side. Um, and yes, they were heavily impacted. But what we have seen particularly in Philadelphia is that these are very resilient individuals with a lot of grit. Mm -hmm. And as bad, as difficult as it was to go through that period of time, many times the condition that these individuals um, face here in this country are probably still more favorable than that they would have faced in their countries of origin. Um, and they come here with incredible positive attitude, really with the energy and desire to turn things around and make a better life for themselves and their family. And they find ways of making it work. Right. And we have, in fact, in the Hispanic Chamber seen how many of these businesses figured it out and thrived during the period. Mm -hmm. There was a period at the very beginning of the pandemic when everybody just, everything came to a halt. Yes. But very quickly, we saw, um, I think um, McKinsey uh, had a report that said that the technological adoption and advancement in the small business sector, in the business sector during the pandemic was in, in like, I don't know, in like six or 10 months, they were able to take a leap that would have taken under normal circumstances like 10 years or something like that. Um, you know, I don't have the, uh, the numbers necessarily accurate, but the magnitude of that leap mm -hmm. was, you know, talk about unprecedented, right? So we saw businesses that did not have a web presence, an internet presence, Mm -hmm. quickly adopt to have websites to have a delivery application like you could right. do the grub hubs and the you know and you could order online and that happened like not instantly but very very fast um so that that was great to see right yeah. but what was also um you know very uh, telling and eye opening for others that do not work in the field in which we work in the i would say in the in the larger economy or mainstream economy is that the real disadvantages and gaps in services capital networks that businesses owned by people of color face mm -hmm. every day this idea so we all know probably your audience knows about the uh, PPP loan program, the right. Paycheck Protection Program, that helped. That that, helped. that was intended to provide businesses with loans that would cover their rent and mm -hmm. their payroll for a period of time, so that they could maintain employment in their businesses. Mm -hmm. If you, if that business submitted and complied with fairly simple requirements then it would be forgiven, that loan would be forgiven, right? But of course, businesses needed to have tax IDs, uh, documentation. payroll, yeah, right. payroll that. documented, their leases documented, right. evidence of payment and all of these things. Not only, so that's one. And the second thing they had to have was a connection to a bank that they could submit an application and it would be reviewed. Um, so, Many of our businesses did not have the paper, right. the re requisite paperwork ready, um, and they did not have the banking relationships necessary. And so that was something that had to be fixed very quickly. Is that what you were able to that intervene? That is what we were yeah. able to do. So uh, particularly for those that had a relationship with the Hispanic Chamber, we sure. had relationships with banks and financial institutions sure. that we could ensure that our members and the businesses affiliated with us would be able to tap in immediately. And that would be getting the, the help that they needed immediately. So. We didn't see a lot of delay in our network mm -hmm. in obtaining the resources, but that's not the case in many other communities. Right. Um, so mostly because in the Latino community in Pennsylvania, we have a nonprofit financial services organization called Community First Fund, 
that is prepared to provide cultural and linguistically you know, um, accessible services to the Latino community. And so we were able to just right. funnel, I mean, not only the Hispanic Chamber, but mm -hmm. many other organizations in that sure. community were able to funnel to that organization um, a lot of businesses. And we have community banks that are also very, have really close relationships uh, with us that we were able to do that with. I don't know that that is the case in many other cities. Right. Yeah, I, I know like uh, some of the institutions that responded very well in, in, in our community, you know, some of the social services and agencies ourselves, and also. Ourselves yeah. through relationships with um, financial services organizations with uh, the United States Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, like the mothership, mm -hmm. we were able to funnel uh, close to $200,000 in microgrants to our businesses without having to request financial right. financials or anything like that. So we were none like of that documentation. Tape. All you needed to have was, you know, be able to answer a very basic mm -hmm. questions about your business. What would you be using the dollars right. for? And you had to have a, a, a legal entity where we could provide dollars. Okay. So we have okay. provided over the last few years a significant amount of would, funding. Would, would, any cases of somebody abusing that in any way? No. No? No. Is I don't that, think... That's usually what happens with those sessions. Yes. You know, I mean, so. well, there's an under... We... Uh, the advantage of, of having... Of belonging to a network mm. as the Philadelphia... Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of, of Commerce is that we know our members. Right. Um, so we can we really can protect ourselves and protect our funders from from abuse. Great. Yeah. Well, it's it's um, time for us to take another uh, break here, and on the other side of this, we'll talk about uh, we're in the midst of a uh, campaign for for mayor and other you know, mm -hmm. elections in this city. So. Estamos en Usa la Media, les habla Fernando Méndez en Compass, en compañía de Jennifer Rodríguez from the uh, Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. No se vayan, regresamos en un momento. Amigos de Usa la Media, estamos aquí de nuevo en Campas. Les habla Fernando Méndez. Dani Ramos dirige este programa. Estamos en compañía de Jennifer Rodríguez from the Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. So, as promised, let's talk about the election. Um, as we were ready to open, you were talking about what's the, the landscape, what it looks like right now. But more than that, uh, if you had one of the candidates in front of you right now, what would you say are the priorities that they have to deal with right now? Well, uh, so I have data behind this, which is fantastic always to, to be able to buttress your arguments. Um, the Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce is part of a coalition that was formed during pa the pandemic called the Diverse Chambers Coalition of Philadelphia that includes not only us, the Hispanic Chamber, but the African American Chamber, Asian Chamber, and the LGBTQ Chamber, which is called Independence Business Alliance of Philadelphia. So these four chambers have come together, and we have been surveying small business owners, mostly diverse business owners, about their priorities, their, and their challenges, their aspirations. And in recent surveys, what we have heard is that 50, about about 50 percent of all businesses have been impacted by the by crime, and that that has become the number one priority for small businesses mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. So, I that would be the priority that we uh, would tell 
the, to, the, to the candidates that they need to really address. Um, the second one would be the ease and the cost of doing business in the city of Philadelphia. Philadelphia doesn't rank very high on the ease of doing business when compared to other cities in North America. And starting a business, hiring your first employee, scaling your business are particularly uh, difficult here in Philadelphia. And thirdly, the cost of doing business. Philadelphia has pretty onerous tax structure for businesses. Now, a good news here is that the Diverse Chambers Coalition um, joined the Greater Chamber, uh, the Mainstream Chamber, last year to advocate for lower BERT and wage taxes. Mm -hmm. And for the first time in since 1985 or something like that, the city decreased lower, business yeah. taxes. Sure. Um, and largely because the diverse chambers, the African American, Asian, Hispanic, and LGBTQ community came together mm -hmm. through this coalition and said, we must do something about this. And I think um, we have had very, very uh, significant impact in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's great. I, I, what you said about you know, having information to back up your, your opinion is, is great, because usually I just issue my opinions without anything to back it up. But <laughs> Not in uh, my shop. <laughs> uh, um, the, the other thing is um, th that we know there is a drug problem in Philly. We cannot ignore that, and a crime problem. So, well, they're you know, all we, they all are we can related. just point to the problem. I mean, we I don't have solutions. Well, um, a lot of people are frustrated by crime, but the truth is that crime can be solved. There's such a thing as a crime science. There are best practices that do absolutely result in have immediate can have immediate impact in crime, and we just have to apply them, have to stick to evidence-based solutions, mm -hmm. and there seems to be. We don't seem to be able or have prioritized that in the city of Philadelphia. Now there's a movement. Mm -hmm. to, to really do that here, and I hope that is successful. Back in the early 2000s, I worked at the Asociación Puerto Riqueños in Marcha with Nilda mm -hmm. Ruiz, a leader here in the city of Philadelphia, and we had a program of community policing mm -hmm. that was studied that resulted in a 30% drop in drug and other criminal activity in like six months. It does not take a long time to see the results when you have a proven strategy. Right. There is a philosophy that is called crime prevention through environmental design. It's a practice that is studied, is applied um, you know, around the country. And here in Philadelphia, there was a time in which we worked with that philosophy. And it's the idea of you can you can modify your physical environment to reduce crime. Now, you're not going to solve the deep root causes of crime. So you need both sides of the coin. You need the immediate, short-term um, sort of strategies and activities that will just cut crime, mm -hmm. while you really have to deal with the root causes of crime in public health, in education. I think we have a very, very important public relation, uh, public education campaign on conflict resolution mm -hmm. and how to address when people, I mean, that, that's a skill. Conflict, right. you can teach that. So how, do, how are we gonna teach conflict resolution to the young people in our community, in our schools, adults? So that has to happen. But if we don't deal with the immediate immediacy then we're we're not going to get to the next to to the next level, um, because we're right now for the second year in a row the city of Philadelphia is losing population. Mm -hmm. When I mean we had been on a population growth strategy, right. they go on a, a population growth trend for over a decade. So sort of steady actually, and so yeah, it, losing some, but but being replaced by immigrants exactly. and so on. But yeah. but not growing right. a net growth of population. Right. 
And so we are now on a downward, uh, you know, demographers will say, don't, don't call it a trend, but uh, two years in a row, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, I'm not going so, to wait. Are we going to wait until we have seven years of population to call it a trend? I would not, you know, I would just say that we need to like uh, kill it and, and, you know, nip it at the butt, as you said. Uh, but there is absolutely work that we can do. It is doable. Our communities can implement these strategies. We can have an immediate impact in crime without forgetting that we need to address the core. Was uh, that one issues. of the uh, uh, strategies used in Camden? Because Camden used to be in the news all the time about the high rate of crime, crime, and crime. And all of a sudden, it's like not much about what's going on there. From my understanding yeah. is, you know, they really did take, and this is where you need leadership, right? They mm -hmm. really talk a very, uh, took a very bold approach. If I understand correctly, they, fi they, they let go of all the police force and rehired it. So they, every police officer had to go through an interview process to get rehired. And they have, been, they have used a lot of technology. Mm -hmm. So they have invested in technology and community policing has been a real, real right. great strategy, right? Um, so I, we, I'm witness that community policing mm -hmm. works. And in fact, today, yesterday, my, my Facebook feed had came up with a picture of our two of our staff members hugging two police officers at a school. Um, and you know, that just reminded me of how close the relationship between the community, the nonprofit community development organization and the police had at the time mm -hmm. in which people were hugging each other, right? Like, would you, like this idea of just neighbors hugging the police today is not something that, 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 th that happens that. or that we really think it's, it's natural. Right. right. Um, uh, but it was, it was for us and for, and you know, while that program and that strategy was implemented in one of the toughest police districts in the city, we saw remarkable improvements. Yes. Well, I, I have seen that in Camden because I teach at Camden uh, uh, County College yeah. and I, you feel safe walking around. It's like, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Yeah. So um, it, it obviously works. Uh, there is, um, yeah, but in this race for mayor, mm -hmm. that's one of the things that people are going to have to respond. I mean, I and I'm, I'm hoping that these candidates are as well informed as you are about the, what, what should I be would done. hope that they are, and if they're not informed, that they have people around them that are they're, very well informed, because the reality is, look, um, can every candidate for mayor be um, an expert on everything? Uh, not. No. But who you surround yourself with is very important. And so I part of what I wish we knew ahead of time is who are you bringing with you to the table, That's right? We don't know. Because in most, cases, we never know. in most cases we do not know and I wish yeah. we did. I wish because the who you bring with yourself to that top job is very it, it really it's more in my opinion sometimes even more important of who you are. Yeah, that reminds me of one of the best examples of that. Uh, Dan Quayle, everybody made fun of Dan Quayle because he's, he has so many faux pas and most of the things he said. But the people that surrounded him had a great impact beyond the years in which he was vice president. I mean, but look here <clears> locally, <throat> uh, gov you know, Ed Rendell, Ed Rendell. Mayor Ed Rendell, yeah. Governor Ed Rendell now. Um, his relationship with David Coppen, right? Yes. And so to date, how many years later, and we still look at that relationship sure. as one that was key in, in that Philadelphia Renaissance, mm -hmm. right? Um, for those that have not read the Prayer of a City, uh, it's a great story of a Philadelphia right. turnaround in the, in the 90s, right? Um, so yes, who, who are you bringing with you? Right. I would love to know. Yeah, like John Fry at Penn, which is now at Drexel, uh, same thing. He transformed the university. Yes. And he's done it twice. Yeah, it, is, it is a team job, <clears throat> teamwork. It's not, you don't do it by yourself. Yeah, and those things require, so speaking of that, you, you actually have a great team. You, uh, Chamber of Commerce, I mean, like, 
I, Very few, but with great impact. I know. A lot of people, when, when they ask me, what's your budget and how many employees do you have, and I disclose, um, they don't believe it. Uh, the reality, yes, I have a team that is bar none, uh, in my opinion, uh, the best that, that anybody could hope for. I want to get Javier Suarez to come and sit here. Uh, you should, you should, I, and, and, and hopefully he'll, he'll agree with me. <laughs> You know, at a time where when so many organizations saw the great, great resignation, mm -hmm. you know, decimated their staffs, people going elsewhere, I am very proud to say that we, our team has remained intact for years at this point. Um, I think it's testament to the work that we do, to the impact that we have in people's lives that our employees and myself included, feel very fulfilled mm -hmm. by the mission and the work that we are attempting to do. We see the Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber not purely as a place in which you come to gather and meet other people and network and hopefully get a it's contract. It's not a social club. We, it, we take it as a, an opportunity to build, to really take economic development building wealth, mm -hmm. creating jobs, moving our community up the economic ladder as the primary goal. And so we do not do anything that ultimately will not result in an opportunity for a business, educational resource network that is very concrete. And, um, and so when, if you come to one of our mixers, and, you know, I'm famous for sometimes saying I, I'm not interested in in getting an invitation to a wedding that came out of this mixer, right? I am interested in learning that you got a contract, that you found a partner, that you have a good lead for mm -hmm. your business out of the work and the, um, you know, that we do. So uh, w one of the things that you have done, and, and we mentioned already, is, is, is that post-COVID, trying to to sort of recover from that. And you say physically you move your offices from yes. downtown. Look, you know, we, we take on the advice that we give. And so, you know, at a time in which the economy was a little bit, not a little bit, very, very uncertain, we made the, the strategic decision that we were going to relocate our offices, mm -hmm. that there was no point in storing furniture in an expensive center city location and move back to the neighborhood where the community, when the organization started. So we are now located within Concilio, which is the mm -hmm. oldest Spanish or sure. organization, uh, Latin organization in the city. And we're there a couple of days a week. Um, we work remotely mostly, less as many businesses and professionals do these days, sure. but we do have um, office hours um, twice a week. Excellent. Uh, well, it's time to take another break. This is our last uh, pause in this uh, program. Estamos en uh, uh, Campas, les habla Fernando Méndez, Dani Ramos dirige este programa en compañía aquí de Jennifer Rodríguez from the Great Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce y tenemos un par de preguntas para cerrar el programa. No se vayan, regresamos en un momento. <música> La media. Amigos de Usa la Media, estamos aquí de nuevo en Campas con Jennifer Rodríguez from the <clears throat> Great Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Again, it's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> so, Jennifer, um, employment is one of those things, you know, the, the labor force. And people, uh, companies complain that we don't have Philadelphia's and have the resources. Don't, mm -hmm. don't have, we don't have the labor force. We, if they want to move here, you know, some of these very large companies, Yes. where is the labor force coming from and all that stuff? One question would be, how do we improve that situation? You know, the other part of this is, then you read about how many jobs go empty. I mean, unfulfilled because yeah. What is happening? Yep. It's like two, two countries. It's a mismatch, things. right? It's a, it's a mismatch. So yeah. what's happening is the skill level <clears throat> of the residents of Philadelphia does not match 
the needs of the employer first. Right. And that's why part of the conversation we're having earlier about skill-based mm -hmm. is a very important. Many of the jobs that are available could be fulfilled if we placed our, 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 our residents in certificate programs that where they can test for certain skills and then get placed in a certain job. And I think there's a great movement. Um, you know, the traditional one is now as the Philadelphia trade unions, their members begin, are aging out, you know, bricklayers, cement layers, sure. welders, all that, they are aging out. They can no longer really perform the job at the same level as they right. did. There are a lot of opportunities for our community members to enter the ranks. Now, you know, that is not a traditional source of employment for Latinos because Latinos were excluded from the unions for generations. For a long time. So, for a long time. So now the unions are really making a great effort in recruiting, you know, members from our community. But that's a, that's a relationship that uh, is, is nascent in many ways and right. building those relationships and those networks. Uh, but that is happening. And so that will be a great source of opportunity to create wealth and, and get employment in our community, right? Now, in order to be successful in a union, you need a basic level of literacy and mathematics. So our schools need mm. to do their part in order to prepare this, this uh, future laborers and, and tradesmen uh, to, to enter the ranks, right? But there's a lot of remedial and pre-apprenticeship programs that are being developed. So I, and anybody in your, in your audience that is interested should really reach out to the local um, Latino organizations like Congreso de Latinos and Concilio right. and others that I think can, can guide them uh, into, into those pathways. Um, and then you also need the employers to be much more liberal, if you will, not from the political sense, but you know, open-minded about what does it really take to fulfill a job in your industry or in your company. Um, and can you structure job descriptions and job tasks so that they're discreet, so that you can bring people and fulfill them? Uh, there's a great opportunity, and I think the city of Philadelphia did get a big grant from the federal government, the Good Jobs Program, to really support this initiative. So I think there's a lot of good strides being being done there. But in the meantime, we have the challenge that we have, right? Um, so, but you know, we do. We absolutely need the skill-based training but our schools, if we do not invest in education, we're just not going to be able to meet the challenges of the future. Right. So this great resignation was the, the result of, of, of COVID and people finding out that they could do other things in life. As, yes, know? yes. Uh, look, I, people had to, had some existential questions that they were able to answer during COVID when they were sitting or working from home or, right. you know, really, uh, you know, exp many of them exploring their, uh, their talents and being able to monetize them. Mm -hmm. Right. You, so you think about the people that were sure. uh, good cooking or doing certain things and they were able to turn into the, you know, to the Internet and do classes and do work. And mm -hmm. so, look, I, I, I think in some measures it's great. I think it's placed a lot of pressure in other industries. We still see uh, the restaurant industry, for example, um, suffering from a suffering? lack of, of, of labor. We see a lot of corporations in their customer service of suffering because they're not able to fulfill mm -hmm. or meet the needs of their client base or customer base uh, with the same level. Um, so, so we're still uh, suffering from it. Yeah, so obviously there are still um, so many jobs that, that go begging because we just don't have the people who are trained to do them and all that. But um, that's what we're you have an impact in this. So I think what we we do is we're able to connect businesses mm. to resources where they can get you know employer you know employees. Um, we we help businesses with human resource experts that can help them um, establish better 
um, how to really think about recruitment. Now, small businesses, particular, are, it's very hard for them to compete with larger corporations in terms of providing benefits mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, health benefits and other perks to their employees right. because, you know, they're not very big. So their buying power of health care is not that, that good, right? So that is a major challenge. So under normal circumstances, you know, when you ask pre-COVID, when you ask businesses what was their number one uh, obstacle, many, uh, you know, at the very, very top was the ability to provide um, benefits, health benefits and retirement benefits to their employees. That is still a challenge, I think, but after COVID, we have other challenges that, you know, have presented themselves more acutely, like crime, the cost of doing business and such. Yeah, uh, well, certainly crime has been a, a tremendous obstacle to, to progress. Um, so the, this governor, Shapiro, because he's from the Philadelphia area, he's, and he knows some of the people in our community, he has taken some of our best brightest, talent. Best and brightest. Best yeah. and brightest with him. And so are we in danger that they will take you away from here too? <laughs> Look, uh, you know, uh, no, we're not in danger at this point. The of, Pennsylvania <laughs> Chamber of Commerce. No, no, no. Well, you know what? What's interestingly enough, Pennsylvania is one of the few states, big states, that does not have a statewide Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. So you can New start Jersey. One. Look, I think there might be a, that's a real serious conversation that we should be having mm -hmm. because so much of what affects small businesses or business in general uh, is really state-bound. Not everything that affects a business is purely in the purview of the local government and right. city government. So there's a lot of, be, of work of, to be done at the state level. Reality is that Latinos in Pennsylvania were not a force to contend with until recent years. Mm -hmm. So I think we might be right now at a point uh, yeah. with one of the fastest Latino growing populations in the nation. Um, you know, we probably need to ask ourselves, are we really doing the best that we can in, without a statewide Hispanic Chamber of Commerce? So there's a task for you ahead. Perhaps. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I was happy to see that, uh, like Rich Negrin, I mean, he, he was a great city managing uh, director. Yes, and Fernando Trevino, uh, my deputy uh, at the mayor's office, well, is now his right. deputy. So F Fernando we're keeping and I have it shows together um, <laughs> until he said, like, I can't do the show because I no, don't no, say he's... anything, but I'm going to work for the state. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and Carolina, the same thing. And you know? Carolina so, as well, yes. Um, in fact, Carolina was scheduled to come, and then she said, no, I can't. Cause, uh, no longer. Come. So yeah. anyway, so but I, I am so happy that you you came finally, because I was trying for a while to, to get you uh, on, on the program. Um, and I'm happy because, see, now you have um, Put me straight. I need to verify before I give my opinion. Your facts. Get, get facts. Um, <laughs> not like, what was it? F famous uh, Trump uh, administration person, this woman who said that there are alternate facts. No, no. no. Let's just <laughs> set this record straight. Uh, there's not a thing, it's such a thing as an alternate fact. No. Fact is a fact. The fact is a fact. <laughs> and, it's, it's and then there's opinions, and right? There's opinions. And then there are opinions, right? But. Oh, that's what I do. I opine. I don't. But I have a few facts also, but uh, opinions are, are my, uh, my trade. I give opinions. Writing editorials, I wrote editorials for uh, El Sol mm -hmm. for a long time. Um, well, Jennifer, this has been a wonderful conversation, and I hope it's Not one that you come back. Yes, absolutely, please. absolutely. Um, because there are other issues, and, uh, and as, as we move on, and, and there's probably a new mayor at some point, and uh, well, no, definitely have a conversation. We'll, have a new mayor. <laughs> uh, well, we'll definitely have a new mayor, yes. So I hope to see you again. Thank you again for spending time with us and responding to my my question. <laughs> My pleasure. Happy to be here and anytime. Wishing you the best with the chamber. Thank you. And señores amigos de uh, Usa la Media, hemos llegado al final de este programa. 
y se despide de ustedes Fernando Méndez en compañía de Jennifer Rodríguez de Greater Philadelphia Hispanic Chamber of Commerce este programa lo dirigió Danny Ramos agradecemos su atención hasta la próxima Thank you.